That's good to see there are some people already here and you're all logging on all at once. It's great. Hi, Dijon. Glad you're here. Um, Janine is coming, attending tonight as well, and I'm hoping she's going to monitor the chat um, so that she can catch any questions that come through there so that I don't have to multitask. This is the first time I've used the webinar function, so I just have to make sure we figure out how to give her permission to speak. We're just going to hang out for a few minutes to make sure that we're past seven. Hello, Janine. Welcome. Are you able to speak? I don't know. Can you hear me? Good. I can. Yes. We signed. I signed you up as a panelist in hopes that you would have that permission to speak. So that's good. Good. We've got a number of people logged on and more coming. So I'm going to leave the chat in your capable hands. Okay. Sounds good. It's a bit weird without the line of faces down the side. I'm used to seeing people at the same time. How many are we expecting? Well, Zoom Online told me that 43 people had signed up. Um, Janine would be one of those, so 42, I would assume. And then I would add in at least 10 not here for forgetting or a really nice sunny evening. Can hardly blame them, it turned out beautiful here. Give them to a 701. It's probably people who are just about to sign in. Hi, Dave and Seely. Yeah, I set it up as a webinar format. So you're able to put questions in the chat box, but it's not a meeting, so you can't participate this time. All right, 701, we're going to start. A few people might trickle in and that's fine. It's just get through the introductions. So welcome. Thank you for coming. My name is Joanna Skomorowski. I am the stewardship coordinator for the Nova Scotia Nature Trust. And um, I don't know if you can see Janine's picture on the side there, but Janine Jaffrey is our stewardship technician and she's going to be manning the chat box today. So if you have questions, feel free to throw them in um, into the chat throughout. And Janine will be keeping an eye on that and we'll hop in uh, whenever there's something 
we need to, um, yeah, we need to talk about. And she will also hopefully give some help if people get stuck on uh, technology stuff, can't turn on sound, that sort of thing. So if you have a question into the chat box, which can be located, I think near the bottom and there should be, it just says chat, you click on it you can type, and you can choose who can see it. So. Right, so why are we doing this? Why are we having this workshop? The answer is when I started at the Nature Trust a couple of years ago, through that first summer and fall, I came to the realization that we were asking volunteers um, to do a really important job, which was to monitor some of our easements. We had a legal obligation to do it well, but we weren't equipping the volunteers very well to do it. We had, at the time, of course, we weren't even, we were just starting to actually do volunteer training as a thing. So <laughs> instead of just one-on-one -on -one in the field, we were starting to have groups of people because there was a lot of interest and people were joining. So this is sort of the culmination of some of the things I've been thinking out about over the last year and a half or so of how do we better equip our volunteers to take care of properties that have specific needs like easements that have, they're different than Nature Trust owned lands. And so as a result, I've pulled together new field forms that I hope will be a help and this workshop, which um, also hopefully will be a help for you. So we're gonna start with the basics, which is, oh, it doesn't like that, oh, too far, sorry. There we go, which is, what is an easement? What's a conservation easement? Well, a regular easement is anything that allows someone else to do something on your land. So it might be a power line easement so that Nova Scotia Power can come and, um, clear the trees under the lines where it crosses your land, or it might be um, a right of way, you know, a neighbor is able to take the driveway through your property to get to theirs. But in the case of a conservation easement, it's a legally binding agreement, which is tied to the title of the land. It's an agreement between the landowner and a conservation organization as to how that land will be cared for and how it will be used, what things will be allowed and what won't can be transferred that easement. So if something catastrophic ever happened to the Nova Scotia Nature Trust, which I sincerely hope it never will, that easement could be transferred to a similar organization. For instance, uh, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, which also has easements and it would still be, the land would still be protected and the easement would still be monitored and cared for. Um, it can also be modified, although that's um, less common, but occasionally um, you sign an easement into agreement and both parties realize the next year that they missed something, they totally forgot something that can be renegotiated and re-registered. It can even be extinguished, which is the official term for when it no longer exists, but that is very rare. The cases I've read about are things, you would need something catastrophic like a dam breaking and completely flooding the land and destroying all the conservation values for which it was protected. If that happened, then maybe the conservation organization would agree to extinguish it so that the landowner could salvage whatever they could from that. And so you might say, well, why do we want conservation easements? And the answer is over 70% of Nova Scotia's land is privately owned. So that means for conservation to work, it can't just be crown land and it can't, it can't just be uh, wilderness areas and provincial parks. Those are wonderful things and we definitely support them. But the ability of a land trust is to delve into lands that are privately owned. And some of those we may end up owning, some of our regular lands we do. But of course, some of those, the landowner may deeply love and care for their land, but they want to still use it and live on it. And so that's where a conservation easement comes in. It gives them the opportunity to protect their land without giving up title to. So easements are different. From nature trust owned land you know if we own a property as the nature trust um, i can just go ahead and visit or uh, maybe local people might want to come and walk along trails or we can just make decisions ourselves for how we're going to care for it but in these cases in easements they're still the landowners so they still get to decide is the public allowed on my land or am i inviting guests over they get to make decisions about um, if they're going to sell their land or if they're going to pass it on to the next generation they make decisions about the use of the land too, but the difference is they make them within parameters, within the terms of the easement. There's a tax benefit to them when they donate an easement. It lowers the value of the land officially because it can no longer be used for a certain number of things. Um, so it's a benefit to them at the time. But like I said, they do give up the right to use it for any possibility. 
So an example of that idea of making decisions within parameters is, for instance, if somebody who had land with an easement, they might say, uh, well, I've decided I want to create a trail on my property. And trails are a pretty common thing to be written in to say, yes, you may create a trail as long as it's not surfaced and it's not too wide and it's, um, it's ecologically sound, you know, it's not going to erode and turn into a mud pit. And so we would not stand in their way. They could still decide to build a trail. Um, but we might have a conversation about how to make it ecologically friendly. But equally, they could also decide, oh, no, I'm not going to build a trail and I'm not going to let anyone on the limit. And that is also OK. They have the right to do that. What it means is that when we are dealing with easements, relationships with the landowner are absolutely critical. So I've, I've put a couple of pictures up here of landowners with whom we have relationships. On the left there is Hardy and Barbara Eschbach. They donated one of our older easements in Water Nish along the St. Mary's River, beautiful floodplain forest. And they have a caretaker who stays there and they're wonderful people. They've been really good to work with in the past. And then on the right, it's um, David Rumsey with Bonnie Sutherland, our executive director. And David has a really neat story. He owns a property in the Mabu area, Mabu Highlands, and he was instrumental in bringing together a number of his neighbors and helping convince them over years that the land should be protected. And as a result, we now own a very large amount of land in that area. And we have four different easements of him and his, uh, on land owned by him and his neighbors. So that begs the question, uh, what's in an easement? What does an actual easement look like? So I'm actually gonna quit sharing my screen for a second so that I can show you one of our actual easements. So this is an easement that is from 2016. So it's one of our newer ones. I think we've only had one or two cents. And this is for Partridge Island, which is in Cumberland County. It would be very close to Parsboro if you happen to know that area. So this is the typical first page of an easement. You'll have, you know, the date and here are the people involved. You know, the governors of Acadia University and Sharon Taylor and the Nova Scotia Nature Trust. And then we talk about the background, like why, why are we doing this? Why is this important? We're doing it to protect forever the natural ecosystems, native species, habitats, and other natural features and phenomena of the property and to allow natural processes to occur in the property and to ensure that it's protected long-term. Future owners will do the same thing. So, and this is the official thing where, you know, it always costs $1, same through donating land, you're actually being paid $1 for it. And it goes through the official definitions of what's in the act, um, it talks about what the purpose is here again, which is, you know, it's not limited to, but it's because of cliff dwelling raptors and other birds um, to allow natural ecological and evolutionary processes to occur. Basically, it's cool conservation wise and we want to protect it. So then it goes into, well, what rights does the owner still have? Um, and it says, well, the owner has the right to say uh, physical access to the general public is not is with their consent only, you know, it's still their land. So they still have general rights to access, to engage it, to invite others over. That's you know normal thing with owning a property. You get to invite people or not. Um, we promise that we're actually a real society, a real charity. Uh, and then this covenants of the party. So they, the parties confirm they've each received and reviewed a copy of the baseline documentation report for the property. So baselines are a big part of my job. And a baseline documentation report is basically a very in-depth look at what is on the property. What ecological values are there? What human use is there? Are there any stewardship issues? Um, what condition is the property in? And it involves both a written document, a lot of maps, and a photo baseline. And the photo baseline is basically a snapshot in time. And the idea of it is that, of it and the baseline, is that future people can look back 20, 30, 50 years from when the property was protected and see what condition it was in then and see what has changed. So the baselines are have to be done, I believe within a year of when you sign the easement so that it's up to date. And both parties have to agree that yes, that easement, that uh, baseline is true. That's exactly what the property looks like right now. So then it's, what does the nature trust promise? Well, it says, we promise we'll hang on to the baseline. We're not gonna lose it on the maps. We promise we'll carry out monitoring, enforcement, and remediation if need be. And we promise we'll communicate with the owner. Again, that partnership and relationship. And the owner's responsibility, they promise that they'll have insurance on the land. 
They promise that they'll um, take careful care of it. They promise that they'll be liable. They still hold the liability for anything that happens on it. They'll pay their taxes um, and they'll communicate with us. They'll let us know if there's any issues. And the easement carries on. So what rights are they giving up to the nature trust? Well, they're giving us the right to visit the property. So we have, we have a limited right to enter the property. Now, uh, this, early, this easement doesn't have it, but some of the earlier ones especially would specify how much time, how much notice you have to give the landowner before you visit the property. And generally it's 24 hours and it's considered 24 hours after you send an email or um, I think it's five business days if you decide to send mail. We do have one easement that requires a letter in the mail a week in advance. And we do have one, I think it's 48 hours. So it's always a good thing to check. And more notice is always polite, I figure too. You wanna to have a good relationship, so you should give people warning. And they might wanna to come too, so. Um, yes, so limited right of access. So we, we can get in there. And this one has a specific one, grants the Nature Trust access to the property for educational purposes with the agreement of the owner. So that means we can do things uh, like guided hikes when we're allowed to do things again. In the case of an emergency, so we hear that there's been you know, a volunteer visits a property and finds an oil tank leaking. That's an emergency. In that case, we are allowed to enter the property without prior permission. And I would say in the case of all of the landowners that we work with, they would be very grateful if we did so um, because nobody wants to see something like soil contamination happening. The easement also says that um, it could be, yeah, what happens when there's damage caused by a third party, you know, somebody across the boundary cuts across the line, um, cuts down part of the forest, what do we do then? We can decide there might be insurance applied to it, or we with the owner might decide to pursue the person who violated it um, legally. What do we do if the owner has a breach? Um, so these are these are more technical things, and I'm not going to I'm just going to touch on them. We're not going to get in depth to them, but it's how how much time do you have to warn people, and um, who's responsible for remediation, depending on who made the mistake or the choice, depending on the case. Uh, it's all compensation. So then here's, you know, where do you send your notice? Here's your addresses. Emergency situations. If a giant wildfire comes through and burns your entire forest, that's not the owner's fault. That's not our fault. It's nobody's fault. It's just nature. Can't help that. And uh, these are all the typical miscellaneous things that end up being things are not actually helpful to us. Let's get those. Everybody signed it. Then you get, this is your official survey description, the kind of thing that says, then proceed 136 chains at 80 degrees at this angle, blah, blah, blah. Um, very useful for describing, but not very helpful for finding your way around if you're not a surveyor. And then typically you've got a map. This one's scanned a bit odd, so it's kind of dark, but you can see this is Partridge Island in black. And this little rectangle here is actually owned by the town of Parsboro, I believe. And then there's a little bit here owned by somebody else. And so that'll typically lay out the property and, and the property ID number and where it is. Get a little, little closer in, a little more detail. And it does lay out some features on that. I'm sorry, I'm tilting my head, but I can't read otherwise. It's, so it's a bench, bridge, lookout, the things that you might expect to find. Then this is Schedule C. Schedule C, you must remember, it is very, very important because this is the most useful thing to anybody who's monitoring a property. This goes through the permitted uses of the property and the prohibited uses. So obviously that's gonna be really, really important. And we're gonna come back to it. There's some fairly typical ones that are in almost every easement, but the really important thing to remember about easements is that everyone is unique. And while we have kind of standard things we would like to see in them, Landowners may have really specific reasons for adding other things, or they may negotiate a certain reserved right. It's called something that they're still allowed to do. So we are, uh, yeah, we're gonna go through most of the things that are here. So I'm not gonna go through it right now, but if you scroll down, you end up with, there's your prohibited use. Um, and those are easy to understand. They're not in legalese, so that's a really great place to go. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing that. Stop share. Back to the presentation. Okay. One thing that that Partridge Island easement did not have on the map 
is something that a lot of them do have, which is called a dwelling area. So if you have somebody who has a cottage or maybe they live year round on the property they're putting the easement on, they're probably going to end up with a dwelling area, which is to say it's the area around the house and it, they have different rights in that area than they do in the natural area. So this is the example of Great Island where we have an easement and you can see, put an extra little map in. This is the dwelling area. So all of those points are photo points for monitoring, but they, they're basically the buildings. There's buildings and there's a wharf and cleared areas. There's the kind of thing that you wouldn't be allowed to do in your natural area that you're protecting. So schedule C, that last section of the easement is your friend. It'll say permitted uses in the dwelling area. What can you do there? So th this is a really good example. These are photos from a couple of our easements. This is David Rumsey's place in Mabu and he's got a cottage. Right, so he's allowed to have that cottage. He's allowed to drive. Motorized vehicles are typically not allowed, so he's allowed to drive in up to his cottage on the access road. Um, he is allowed to have it uh, mowed, right, to have the grass mowed and cared for. And over here, we have an example of a different easement, and the landowners have a really big garden. So that's a typical thing that would be allowed in your dwelling area, or they might have the right to um, might have the right to cut a couple of cords of wood for firewood. They might even have that on the natural area. In fact, depending on the easement. Well, what about the natural area? What are you allowed to do there? Oh, oh actually, sorry, I missed one or two things there. Even if they don't have a building, they may reserve the right to build one. So easements, several of them may say, we're allowed one tent pad or one cabin of this size of two stories tall or no taller than this in this location. So we have several easements where that right is reserved but may not have been exercised. They may also be allowed to keep a field mown or keep a viewscape open for the building. And they may also be allowed to replace the building. If it starts to fall down and needs really serious repairs, they're often allowed to replace it so long as they don't make it any larger. That's why you check your notes, you don't have to go back. So what can you do in the natural area? And the answer is probably things that most of us like to do, which hiking, I believe the phrase they like to use is low impact, non-motorized outdoor recreational activities. So you can picture that, a picnic, a hike, uh, berry picking, bird watching, all the things that you can do that are not harmful, they're just us enjoying the outdoors. A uh, pretty common one is installation of signs. This is on Bon Portage Island on the South Shore. This is a, a nature trust sign that we installed, one of my predecessors put in. Usually the use or creation of unsurfaced trails is a pretty common one, no wider than 1.5 meters. You know, they're not paved or graveled or anything. Pruning, tree removal for safety. If you get trees come down over your trails, it, you are allowed to bring a chainsaw in and remove that so that it's not a safety hazard. And then there's some that are kind of in between. Hunting and camping are two that can go either way. The landowner may specifically say no hunting is allowed, or they may say the hunting is allowed, or they may not specify. Right, so this is the participatory, participatory section. Have a look at your chat box. What do you think would be commonly prohibited uses? This is, con think conservation lands. Um, this could be shoreline, beaches. It could be forest. Have a look, click on your chat box and Tell me uh, what things you're not allowed to do. Okay, we got logging first, right? That's, that's obvious, there's a, there's a giant giant pile of logs here. So if you come into an easement and you see that, there's a problem. <laughs> that is definitely something that is not allowed. What else we got, Janine? Some campfires. Uh, uh, campfires are one of those things that can go either way, depending on, sometimes they'll specify you may have campfires at this location in this one fire pit. Um, from Rochelle, she says planting invasive, invasive species. Oh, is Rochelle a gardener? Because over here we have Japanese knotweed, which if anybody gardens, this is a nightmare to remove. It is really, really nasty. So yes, planting invasive species or um, introducing invasive species, including mammals or birds, definitely prohibited. Um, tree stands for hunting? Uh, that one actually goes either way, depending on the landowner. Like, because it is private land, so the landowner gets to decide if they are going to allow tree stands or not. Nature Trust policy on our own lands does not allow buildings, and so 
sort of, uh, it would depend on your tree stand too, whether how permanent it was, I think. Um, we have general burning from Elizabeth. Like a burn pile? I'm gonna assume that means like a giant burn pile or burning down the forest. Um, actually, burning down the forest is not yeah. specifically prohibited, but I think maybe it's in the category of assumed. <laughs> uh, and um, burn piles are not specifically mentioned either. We have herbicide use as well. You know, that one's not, oh no, no, that is true. Because there is um, storing of toxic chemicals is on the list of things that's typically there. They make an exception for gasoline and jerry cans, but you're not supposed to have anything like herbicides on the property. Um, there's also the use of motorized vehicles or ATVing or dirt biking. Bingo, that is the major one. And that's the perfect phrase, the use of motorized vehicles. We don't care if it has two wheels or four, um, it should not be driving through a natural area. Uh, trapping is in hunting, I think. Trapping, uh, I think I have seen specified in at least one easement, but it's generally not addressed. So I think that's one that one's often left up to the landowner. Um, garbage disposal, improper garbage disposal. Oh, sure is. Dumping is a standard thing involved in, in easements. Please do uh, not dump things, yeah. And we have overnight camping from Kevin. Again, uh, that one's actually a funny mix. The, the Shiprock Islands is an easement on the eastern shore and that owner specifically put in his easements that people were allowed to come and camp on the island if it was non-destructive camping. So that one could, could be either. Yeah, so thanks, that, that was a really good list. I mean, you hit most of the main ones. Now, one of the ones you didn't hit was mineral explore, exploration. So someone can get a mineral exploration license in Nova Scotia for your land without you knowing about it, but they cannot come into your land to do sampling without permission. So that is something that's always in our easement saying that uh, it's not allowed. And then dredging or diking or modifying the water courses, any sort of major land moving, definitely not allowed. And this is one that um, I had not thought of until I started to deal with easements, but subdividing, subdividing and selling part of it. The easement must remain as a whole. Now, this can be a little tricky when you get an easement that's made up of multiple property ID numbers. Those property, those PIDs can be sold separately, uh, although the spirit, the intention of it is that they're kept together, but legally those ones can be sold. So non-native species, we hit that. Um, construction, you, you can't build roads. You can't build roads, can't build buildings, can't construct things. Um, also, you can't grant other easements to make it complicated. Like if you, you know, you can't have an easement on top of an easement so that you have people conflicting for who has the right to do what. And we hit the motorized vehicles. And I did see early on when I was looking at the chat agriculture and whoever said that is also quite right. That is always in it as well. So well done, that was pretty good. Um, David has a question about using herbicides to control invasive species. Ooh, excellent question. Yes, so the easements specifically say, I believe, storing or dumping contaminants. Um, I would say that in, in that kind of case, that would be a conversation between the Nature Trust and the landowner, because there are cases like Japanese knotweed where it is very, very difficult to remove sometimes without herbicide. So we might consider it a necessary evil in that case. Um, and Kevin now has a question. If um, somebody has mineral rights for a property, can, they, can the owner stop exploration? It's a tricky question uh, from my, so I did a bit of research on this last year and spoke to somebody from the licensing office. And my understanding is that they may have a license that covers part of your property just because I sell them in grids. So it's, you know, it's not even with the property outline, um, but they cannot come onto your property to do initial sampling without, um, without permission. Now, that being said, we probably all know stories about really large mining conglomerates who you know, who got rights to certain properties. I don't really know how that works, so. All right, next. So, Nature Trust easements specifically. We have 32 of them right now, and you can see they're dotted right across the province from all the way up at the tip of Cape Breton, I think that's in North Harbor, all the way down to Bon Portage Island at the south. We have, um, something you might not expect, which is we have a number of easements with the province. So we had a program at the Nature Trust for a certain amount of time where we would, we would buy land or have it donated and we would transfer it to the province, maybe because it was an inholding in the middle of a wilderness area 
or maybe because we thought they could give it better protection as a part of a nature reserve. Um, but we transferred it with an easement on it. So one of the landowners that we monitor is the province of Nova Scotia, <laughs> specifically uh, sometimes the Department of the Environment Protected Areas Branch and sometimes Department of Lands and Forestry, depending on who it was transferred to. We have, so we have yeah nine from the Crown. We have three that are for Acadia University. Acadia owns uh, Partridge Island, which is here, the one that we looked at, and Bon Portage Island, which is here. And then I think it'd be this one, which is Hemian's Head, um, Black Rock Beach. And we have one with the town of Wolfville, which is the Wolfville watershed, lovely set of hiking trails and mature forest. So it is a bit of a misnomer sometimes when we say landowner and you think like one or two people, because sometimes the situation is a little more complicated than that. The rest of them are privately owned. They're just individual landowners who loved their land and decided they wanted to protect them. Um, a fair number of them are American and haven't been able to come this last year and a bit because of the pandemic. So they're quite grateful to have reports of how their property is doing while they're gone. All of these easements are unique. You know, we went over a lot of the standard forbidden things and those, those are pretty standard. But for instance, Partridge Island retained the right to have mist nets for banding birds. So th those are ways of capturing small birds, songbirds. So you can put um, bands on their legs as part of research and probably since it's Acadia as part of training students. And that's something that you would not find in a lot of the other easements because it's not necessary. But that's why it's absolutely critical to check the specific easement before you visit property. So we're gonna talk about that. So you've signed up for an easement. You're gonna go monitor it. What do you need to do? Well, the first thing you need to do is you need to let the landowner know. In the cases of the land that's privately owned, we will generally uh, introduce people by email. We'll introduce the volunteer to the landowner and then ask to be copied on emails. So you'll let us know and let the landowner know that you're planning on visiting. And um, you have to arrange a date with them. You know, you, you can't necessarily just say, I'm coming on this date. It's um, sometimes the landowner may want to be there and can't. Um, a lot of them are really, really easygoing and or aren't here because they're um, in the States somewhere. So it is quite easy just to go. But it's good to know one way or the other what your landowner might like. And it's also a really good time to ask the landowner themselves as the partner in caring for this land, have there been any major changes in this last year? Or are you planning any changes this year? Are you planning to do repairs to that old barn? Or are you planning on doing anything different than before? Have you noticed anything different? It's always considered polite to invite the landowner to come with you. Most of the time they won't, or they may only want to come for a part of it. They may not want to come crawling through the backwoods if you're planning on doing the whole boundary of a big property, but they may want to have a conversation and wander around um, where the house and gardens are, which is great. And then what are you going to do next? You're going to look at the easement. Schedule C is your friend. So you're going to look at the easement, you're going to scroll to the very end of it, and you're going to look at the things that are allowed and not allowed so they're fresh in your mind. So you know what things you're looking for. Some things are super obvious, like Nobody's created a giant farm here this year. Okay, check. But some things are harder to remember and it's good to know, you know, were they allowed to replace that building or build a new one? Because I think they're building a new one. And that's why you're checking before you go. And then you're gonna look at, look at last year's report. And whether that was you who wrote it or someone else, there will be a last year's report, unless something's gone wrong. And that'll give you a hint of what condition you're likely to find. And you'll look at your maps. And the reality is that the places that are most at risk on properties are the places used by humans. <laughs> so, Cause we're the ones who cause the stewardship issues. So you're gonna to wanna to prioritize, maybe you don't have time to go to the whole property. It's really big. It takes two days to do the whole thing and you don't have time to do the whole thing. So you're gonna go see the places that are most at risk or you're gonna go see the places that didn't get visited last year. It's also important too, to check when you're checking last year's report and to see, especially if you haven't been there before, you know, are there any hazards? Were there any new ones that were mentioned? You know, um, has there been a bit of a landslide on, on the bank by the river or just anything you might need to know? There's old abandoned mine shafts on the property there. Then you're gonna visit the easement and you're gonna have a great time tromping around through the, the property and seeing the place and hopefully enjoying the beauty. And while you're there, you're going to fill out the new field sheet, which we are about to go over, which is, is meant to hopefully be a really useful tool for you so you know what you're looking for. 
and you're going to take a lot of photos because you're going to be doing the photo monitoring, which we will also talk about. And then you're done. And so you're going to tidy up your notes. You're going to send in your photos, your GPS points, and your tracks, and your report to me. Um, your photos are hopefully going to be labeled so I know um, which photo point they belong to. And if you have a GPS, there's going to be tracks and uh, points. We at the Nature Trust have a number of GPSs for the use of volunteers. So if you would like to use a GPS while you're going, we are able to load that with the boundary as well as the points. And I am happy to mail that to you. It is still way cheaper for me to mail you a GPS and to pay for you to mail it back than it is for me to rent a vehicle, drive to the South Shore, monitor it myself, or send Janine in the opposite direction to Cape Breton to do it there. Um, so that's fine if we need to, to mail and then mail back. And it gives you a little bit more accuracy. Okay, field form. So I realized, stop sharing again. I realized uh, again over the last year and a half that we were sending volunteers out to the field without really telling them what they were looking for. You know, you, you need, sometimes you need a bit of a checklist to work through. It makes it way easier. So created this form for this year. This is your, <clears throat> this will hopefully be a tool to really help you as you go. So field monitor, who are you? And you know what? I forgot some, I forgot the date. I'm going to have to add that in, but there should be something for the date. And there's a reminder, you know, make sure you look at the baseline, make sure you look at the monitoring report, make sure you look at Schedule C and talk to the landowner. Oh, I will say the exception to the landowner thing is the Crown land ones do not need, we don't notify the province before we visit them because they're, they're generally part or next to wilderness areas or nature reserves and they're, they're meant to be open for people anyways. Um, even though the Wolfville watershed is open for hiking and you're welcome to visit anytime, I do notify them before we do the actual annual monitoring formally. And we are actually struggling to figure out who our contact is at Acadia. So we haven't notified them. We send them the reports afterwards, but we don't tend to notify them first because uh, we're not sure who to notify. So we're working on it. So this is the form. So Eastman, where are you? What property are you on? Location. Doesn't have to be fancy, just what community are you in? Who owns it? <laughs> is the owner with you? Is there a renter or a custodian? This past year, we had, we had a property being rented, I think, for the first time, and which is quite allowed under the easement. We just make sure that the renter also knows about the things they're allowed to do and not allowed to do. Um, who's the lead monitor? Now I see I've actually got it in two places. This is a great way to learn to do your editing during the presentation. So did other people come with you? Did you bring your best buddy? You know, did your wife come? Yeah, who else is there? Coworker? When this, you may not have the answer to this, but hopefully you will, because you'll have the previous monitoring report. But when was the last time it was looked at? Hopefully it'll just be a year or, you know, 12 months, 14 months, 16 months. Um, what was the weather like? Because sometimes that influences it. You wonder why, why is this report really, really short? And then you see the weather conditions and it says pouring rain. Okay. Duration of visit. This one is actually really important for us for tracking purposes because we have to submit um, information to the IRS because of the uh, American landowners and we have a fair number of them. And we also track it for our own use. Then how big is the property and how big is the dwelling area? And that should be on last year's report too. So, so permitted land uses. One of the things that we track is what reserved rights is the landowner using? And so some of these are really common, obvious things. Maintenance on the property, landowners replacing windows. Totally normal thing. It's just, it's just a matter of, of keeping track of it. Are they replacing buildings? That's pretty commonly allowed. Um, have they removed any downed or hung up trees that are a safety problem? Are they maintaining the driveway or road or trail? Um, are they using the land in a low impact, non-mechanized fashion? Have they placed any signs? Um, have they made New footpaths. Now the answer, this one is, is a bit more specific. They can make those paths, but that does need to be with advanced permission of the Nature Trust. So um, please do let us know if you find new paths. So you're just gonna say, is this happening on the property? Yes or no, 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 yes. And then you're also going to check Schedule C. That's embarrassing, it's written a C there, D there. Um, check Schedule C near the end of the easement document. Check the list. Are they doing any of the other things that they're allowed to do? So that should be pretty easy. Prohibited land uses. So most of the time, 
these are going to be really easy to see that they're not happening happening rather you're going to know there's not a quarry running on the property um but it's really good to have it there just to jog your memory to remember oh yeah these are the things i should be looking for construction outside the dwelling area right that that's something that could happen um you're not going to know i suppose if an easement is allowed but you might see a right of way you might see other people using using the road to get to somewhere else dumping toxic materials i hope you're going to report it anyways and be worried Basically, if any of these things is happening, alteration of the surface of the land, um, cutting or removal, destruction of vegetation, something causing significant soil degradation or erosion, water pollution, altering watercourses and ponds. Um, and whoever asked the questions about herbicides, I pulled this out of a different easement, but it's not in all of them. But this one definitely had it. I forget which one it was. So critically for this one, if any of these things is happening, not only are you going to put yes over here, you are please going to take lots and lots of photos. You're going to take a GPS point if you're able to, or you're going to mark it on the map, monitoring map. And then you are going to make lots and lots of notes, lots of details. Um, if, you, if you really think there's an issue, then we need all the details to cover it. Because if someday, if someday we need to go to court, then we need evidence um, to be able to back it up, the evidence of what happened. Janine, any more questions float in as I'm going? Yes, we have a question from Laurel who would like to know if Partridge Island is one of the properties where you would not have to notify the owner prior to visiting. It, it is indeed, because I have spent the last year trying to figure out who at Acadia I'm supposed to contact. Um, and it is also one where it's got a public hiking trail. So that's fine. Yeah, that is one of the ones that you can visit without prior notice. Okay, so th those are for the generic prohibited land uses. These are the, the ones that are specific, right? You're gonna check Schedule C, which again, I have embarrassingly called Schedule D. And you're gonna say, are there any of those specific things that are actually happening? This was the other thing I was trying to capture. One of the things we, we keep an eye on, you might say, is change over time. And some of those might qualify as, um, as an easement violation, but some of them literally are just change. So for instance, is there a giant beaver dam now that there wasn't before and it's flooding part of the area? Well, that's not an easement violation at all, but it is really useful to know because it may be a reason for why, um, why the trees are dying because they're standing in a pond suddenly or why the landscape has changed in that area. So basically any, any new things, any new property use, any new buildings, any new trails, any new signs, any new anything. Any tree planting, agricultural activity, um, any change, any invasive species control projects? Are they trying to haul out the Japanese knotweed? Are they doing any ecological restoration? So some of these are positive as well as negative. So you're just gonna say yes or no. And then if it exists, again, GPS points, mark on the map, take photos, and then make lots of notes. And these things, these questions are more specific things that don't fit in a category. So. Um, are there any concerns about the boundaries regarding encroachment or change in neighboring land use that may affect the easement? So as you drive up, you realize that um, the neighbor has clear cut right up to the, the edge of the boundary. Well, that's going to impact what birds will live in your property because some birds only live in interior forest and you just moved to the edge of the forest half a kilometer inland. So that may be important to know or uh, you may you may think hey, wait a second, I just saw the property pin and I'm pretty sure that this cut goes over the boundary. Uh, so there may be a misunderstanding about where the boundary is with the neighbor and that may be something that we need to look at. So then the beaver dam example I gave, maybe that beaver dam is actually threatening to flood the area where the really rare plant is that we protected the property for. And in that case, we may actually decide that we do want to do something. And that's why it's important to look at that. Um, while you were out and about, did you, nearly tumble down an old well that we didn't know about. I sincerely hope that will never ever happen. But <laughs> you never know what can happen. People have lived in Nova Scotia for a long time. So um, did you find any hazards that you need to let your future self know about or the future monitor? And just for fun, because we want to know, did you find any species at risk? Did you see any piping plovers at that beach, for instance? Or did you, um, maybe you're a birder and you, you happen to hear Canada warblers while you were on the property. That's great stuff to know. Can't protect it if we don't know about it. Um, there's trails, you know, there's allowed trails on the property, but you're, you walk one of them and you think, oh, <laughs> you know, that's in dreadful condition. It's washed out entirely. The bridge has fallen in. That's important to know. And then 
the critical question, is any action immediately required? Is there an emergency? And I would hope that, um, to be honest, I would hope that if it's really an emergency emergency that you would just contact us right away and we'll get the details in the report after. And then this goes back to your conversation with the landowner. If you were in communication with them, did they make any comments about the property, past change, future change, anything that they're, they're thinking about? So yeah, any questions before we leave this form? Yes, we do have another question. Um, are the properties surveyed and migrated? Surveyed and what? Migrated. Oh, migrated. Uh, I think most of them are migrated before we get them, but I think they are, if they aren't, they become so once we have them. And surveyed, I, most of them are, I'm just trying to run through in my head to think, are they all? I think they have to be for easements. And I've seen survey maps for most of them. So I'm gonna go with yes on that one. Okay. Um, Kevin would like to know who is responsible for things like maintaining existing trails and fences, etc. Yeah, a good question. Um, the landowner is, you know, it's their land, it's their trail, it's their fence. So they're the ones responsible. Now, that being said, on places where there are um, trail networks, we're often, we often partner with them or we'll offer, we'll say, oh, we have volunteers who really love this place and who are willing to do some of the work. Would you like help? Um, even at, at the Wolf of Watershed, for instance, they have a mud dam higher up and a concrete dam down below, and they're, they're planning on doing repairs to them in the future. But one of our volunteers has offered currently to check the, I think it's the water gauge for the upper dam <laughs> for the town of Wolfville, who's the landowner. So he just happens to be up there because he hikes every week. And so he's sending in that information um, to help. But it is in the end, the dam is not our responsibility. It is the town of Wolfville's responsibility. Um, another question is, do we ever take volunteers out with us when we go to properties? As in Laura, us, like Janine and myself? I Ooh, think we so. sure do, don't we, Janine? Yes, we do. <laughs> you did a few last year with people, didn't you? Yeah, I did a few out in the 100 Wild Islands, and then I was out with Dave and Seeley, and yeah, a few different people. Yeah, I've also gone out with volunteers. Um, it might be because the volunteer is new and would like a bit of help being launched into their new property. Um, and we also do try to visit easements ourselves once every four years or so at, at the bare minimum or more often if there's issues. And so we may just end up partnering up with you to do an easement. We like company when there's not COVID. <laughs> We're not allowed to take people right now, but once restrictions lift, we do like company. I think that's all our questions for now. All right, back to the presentation. Okay, saw the field form. Come on, wake up. There we go. Okay. So as a part of your monitoring, anybody who is currently a property guardian is probably going to recognize this. This is a portion of the photo monitoring. So photo monitoring is one of the tools that we use to, to track change on properties. So I always, I always compare it to a dental checkup. You know, some people uh, come from genetic backgrounds where they don't have a lot of bacteria in their mouth and their teeth just do really well as long as they keep brushing them, but they still go to the dentist once a year or twice a year. And the dentist does the checkup and says, no, you're fine, carry on. That's what this is most of the time. Most of the time you're going, you're looking, you're thinking this looks exactly the same as it did last year, or I think that tree is a little taller and that's it. And that's okay. Because if we ever had to go to court, we can take those photos and say, look, in 2018 and 2019 and 2020, the tree line ended right here in this photo, but in 2021, it's all the way over here. And so you can prove that it was cut because you have the photos from year to year. The photos are heavily weighted to places that humans use. So there's gonna be a lot more in the areas that are in the dwelling areas and entrance and trails than there are in the middle of the woods somewhere. Um, you may find that some of them may say, use for monitoring, no. <laughs> that means you do not need to go there and take that photo. Sometimes it's really helpful to have a photo in a baseline just to say, here's an example of a forest or a cliff, just to show that this is the kind of thing on the property. But you don't need a photo again every year of that cliff or of, um, of that stand of trees. You know, It's just to show what the character of it is. But the stewardship related ones, we do want the photos every year, definitely. So uh, it'll have a name. This will be the photo point that'll be on, I'm sorry, that'll be on the map. And a description of where the location is. This is from Gold River Lake, which is, 
kind of right in the middle of Nova Scotia, um, a little towards the southern end. It's this property actually surrounds the whole of Gold River Lake, and then the Gold River flows out of the south end. It's very pretty, actually. I like the spot. There will be a compass direction for the photo. This is just meant to be a tool. It's meant to say, if you're uncertain, you're standing in the spot, but you're uncertain what direction, it'll tell you which way to turn. It is totally irrelevant whether, you know, whether this tree is half in or a quarter in, or whether this chair is positioned in exactly the same state. The point is, this was a campsite. Has it been used? So if the angle is slightly different, don't fret over that. We just want, the point is we want to know, has it been used to somebody built a cabin? And the cool thing with this, of course, is that if we just get a whole raft of photos from somebody and they're not labeled, it gets really tricky for us to pull a report together if we haven't been to the location ourselves. So it's really important that you either put the photos into the report, the digital report yourselves, or you label them. Now, this is actually gonna become a whole lot easier in the next year because we are in the process of acquiring a stewardship database. And the database comes with an app and the app can be used on um, Android or iPhones and or iPads or tablets. And it will allow you to take photos that will automatically geolocate them. It'll automatically pinpoint where they are. And when you get back within range of Wi-Fi, it'll automatically upload everything into the database. So all of your photos will just land on a map in my database, <laughs> along with your notes and your comments. And we will we'll just we'll have it there and it'll spit out a report that might only need some editing from us before we send them off. So that's good. That's going to be quite helpful. Um, all right. All right, red flags. So what things are you going to be worried about if you see and these are all, of course, all in relation to the forbidden uses. So does anybody know what this is here? What do you see? Chat box. Um, flagging tape. Okay, flagging tape, why? What's that on the tree? Anybody know? Okay. This, this is a blaze line. This is a surveyed blaze line. So if you're in the middle of your nice big easement property, you're walking along and suddenly there's a blazed survey line right through the middle, that is a problem because that means somebody is planning to sell half of it <laughs> or a chunk of it. And I put this one in specifically because this actually happened. Uh, it wasn't caught by a monitor visiting, although it might have the next time they went out. It was because someone called us and said, I'm buying this chunk of land in this location and uh, I see there's something tied to the title and easement or something and and we had to tell the landowners no you can't actually you agreed when you bought the land it has the easement on it they hadn't been the original ones to put the easement in place um, but it says in it you can't subdivide and sell so this is a red flag if you happen to see a survey line that is not on the edge of the property this one's gonna be a pretty obvious one. I think anybody who monitors who goes out to the woods and suddenly sees a large road blasted through the middle is probably going to be worried. If you find a road like that, please follow it, see where it goes. Does it lead to a giant logging pile? That's really important to know. Um, please document lots. Oh, ATVs, they have their purposes, but they are the bane of my existence sometimes. Uh, this shoreline is in Yarmouth County, and you can't quite see them, but the little dots there are called Plymouth Gentian, and they're an extremely rare flower. They only grow in a certain number of lakes in southwest Nova Scotia. And what do I find when I visit but ATV tracks driving straight through the flowers <laughs> for which we protected the property? Not just those flowers, but they were a big part of it. So that's a red flag, right? That's an issue, especially if it becomes, um, you can see this is kind of an older one. It's not very fresh. But this is fresh, right? This is through a salt marsh. If you've got tracks that are fresh, and especially if it's like a new established trail, that's a problem that we may need to intervene. We may need to talk to the landowner and consider um, boulders, you know, boulders blocking the way, not that they work in the salt marsh, but, um, or signage, or we would just have to discuss options for what to do. And in a case like this, I would probably assume that it's someone outside the property and not the landowner. <laughs> okay. Big red flag, this is a real one. This, this is actually an easement violation that happened. Um, and in this case, it was mostly an accident. So the monitors went to visit Bonportage Island, um, which is with Acadia University. 
and they found this area with sawn off trees. It's hard to tell because it's such a rough looking forest on that island to start with, but they did clear the forest out of here. And two years later, this is what existed. Um, but in the meantime, they had had communication with Acadia. And I think there'd been, because there was a third party involved who hadn't um, I think been fully involved in the easement discussions, there was a misunderstanding about what was allowed and what wasn't. So this was actually one case where uh, where we did sit down and renegotiate part of the easement to allow this new cookhouse to be built and and to also clarify so that hopefully that kind of thing won't happen in the future. Yeah. Okay, so you found one of the red flags. You're out on a property, you found one of the red flags. What are you going to do now? Document, 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 document. That is the number one most important thing. And then please contact us as soon as possible. Contact me, contact Janine. If you can't get either of us, call up the office and say the words easement violation. <laughs> you will be very likely to get someone's attention very quickly. Um, especially if it's an emergency, if you find something, like I said, oil tank draining, fire, you know, some giant catastrophe. It's probably the kind of thing that happens once every 20 years, but it could happen. So um, please do let us know. Scribble on your map. You don't have a GPS, scribble notes on your map, draw your track, show where you were. And then what are we going to do, right? What are we going to do? You call us and say there's an easement. Well, it depends what kind of, it depends what kind of violation. It depends what kind of violation, but the first thing is just going to be a conversation. So we're going to, we're going to call up the landowner and say, um, we're worried about this. We have our, our easement volunteer found this and we're worried about it um, and see what they know. Maybe they don't know about it. You know, maybe it's something caused by a neighbor or maybe they completely didn't understand. And so yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna look at your field data. So if it, it could be compliance or it might not be, <laughs> but we're gonna review all the field report. Um, it could go any number of ways. You know, maybe we send out a staff member because we're not quite certain and, and we just need a little more information. Um, or maybe we have a conversation with the landowner, or maybe we have a meeting with the landowner, or on the far escalated scale, we may take the landowner to court. That has never happened. But that is a that is the point of an easement, right? It, is if you get really really terrible violations, you you can't actually hold someone accountable. But if all goes well, hopefully, hopefully they're compliant. So we're gonna we're gonna write a letter to the landowners. Uh, we may have a meeting anyways, just because um, we're we're both worried about something and we want to work it out together. And I would say too, especially for the private landowners, um, the people from uh, Acadia or Wolfville or, or the province won't care as much. But for the private landowners. It's a really kind thing to send a couple of nice photos if you took any any nice ones um, or for sending it we'll do that or a couple of lines just to comment um, and to, to keep that relationship going. It's a courtesy, I guess. Yeah, it's a kindness. Um, so that's oh yeah, Scott go ahead. has a question. Um, yeah, he great. wanted to know how often we reach out to ATV clubs um, to ask them to avoid certain areas um because some people don't belong to certain clubs but how would we be able to educate atv writers yeah um I, I would say how often do we reach out i would say it's kind of like spot checking it depends if we're running into a problem in a specific area so last year at one of the easements we had piping plovers nesting for the first time in four years and that was a huge deal and they nested in the worst possible spot right next to the one atv track running across the cobble beach and so we did i did contact the local atv club to say just so you know this is happening oh and i should i should specify that property is one place where we have negotiated with the local atv users to use the one path so they have permission to use the one path to get to the mud flats um, so we contacted them to say can you please let your members know that this is happening these birds are nesting and they need to go super slow through that section and so that's really satisfying when it works out when you get, you know, because people belong to clubs, most of them are pretty responsible and they, you know, they do it um, because they like being outdoors themselves, just in a different way than we do. Um, but that is something that I think we should do more of, in my opinion, more, more outreach in that way. Um, any other questions? Not right now. All right. Well, so we still have a number of easements that don't have dedicated property guardians and for easements we really do like um, we would much rather have people who are able to commit um, to build, help build that relationship with the landowners over multiple years. Now, of course, you can't predict everything. You don't know if your job is going to transfer you next year. But um, so if you are interested in that kind of thing, we do still have a few in Mabu. We um, not totally sure on the list with me, but we can potentially link you up with an easement that needs a monitor. 
Um, we are not training new volunteers this summer, as far as I know, except for one or two here and there. But we will eventually be moving back into training groups of volunteers again. So if you're not currently one, um, we're always interested in more. So I will take, what are we at here? Look at that, 757. That's pretty good. I'll give you one more chance. Are there any other questions you would like to ask about? Easements. Ken McKenna has raised his hand. I didn't even know that was a function. Uh, Ken, I might even be able to, I can allow you to talk. Here you go. There's a button for that. You can either talk or um, put it in the chat there, Ken. Mm, having trouble figuring it out? I think you're unmuted, Ken, if you want to speak. Okay, I, I hit the button, the hand button accidentally. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, yeah, no worries. Glad you're here at least. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a functioning hand button. I didn't even know we had that. All right, well, nobody's got any questions. Then I won't keep you past the time. Thank you so much for attending. I'm, I'm really excited that there were so many of you. Um, this will be recorded and available if anybody else is interested who wasn't able to make it tonight. And here's hoping that COVID restrictions will lift soon and we'll all be able to get back out to the places that we love that are a little further afield than just in our municipality. All right, take care. Bye.